Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for coming. We may have one or two more people, hopefully not more than four, five that we've got chairs for. We, uh, we may have a few more people coming. But uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much uh, indeed for coming. This is our largest seminar yet, and it just goes to show how incredibly important GDPR is and is being how, um, uh, how you're treating it very importantly uh, to, to uh, meet all the challenges that it presents. So uh, we're doing this in association with Softworks, who will be speaking, and we're very grateful to um, Central Hall Westminster for hosting this and also to Be There Global for webcasting this. We've got 37 people watching this. Well, it's turned on on their computers at the moment, hopefully watching it. So, um, just a quick, a few things about our organization. The Association of Association Executives, that's a bit of a mouthful. We've been going 11 years, um, previously Associations Network, and we help, we engage with you, we educate, and we empower you. We provide a lot of information, as well as workshops and our congresses. Um, it is free to join, so if you haven't already joined, you do need to do that. Um, these are some of the things that we do, um, uh, and which we offer. We've got 200 videos plus, we've got 80 success stories. Those are case studies of successful projects other associations, and maybe in your own associations, have, have completed. Sometimes with a lot of statistics and data, a lot of charts, uh, task lists, and even financial data as well to help you work out how, how your projects or projects that you have in mind uh, might go and what they might cost. So do, do access those. We've got our magazine, of which you can see our last edition um, on your tables. And we've got a weekly, we've got a monthly e-newsletter. And for members, we have new content we publish every week as well. We produce a few Outlook research reports, and so these are more like uh, information, infographics, which tends to be the medium that people want, not very long reports. Um, we have one out on research that we did with PwC, and we've got one coming up on video as well. Uh, we have some destination update reports. Some of you who hold uh, conferences out of the UK may find those useful because you can then just see what are the changes in things like um, getting visas and new conference centres, certainly in developing worlds where you find it challenging to get a, a, a very good and professional venue. We are just relaunching our associations TV.com channel, which we do in association with Be There Global and also with ITN. And we'll have that relaunched in the next month or so. We provide networking events like these and other ones, just parties. And we've got some books that we're publishing. Um, you can see the events mentioned here, our World Congress, our UK Congress. We've got some leaders forums that we do around the world, as well as in the UK, um, in London in July, as well as um, beside our UK Congress. Our member engagement conference is on the 9th of June. And our event strategy conference, which is by invitation only for um, head of events at associations, is on the sixth. Sorry, the 9th of July. Sorry, is the engage conference, and the event strategy conference is the 16th of July. We have our association awards. What's very important about these association awards? It is free to enter, and if you are shortlisted, it is free to attend. Okay, you do not get like a, oh, you're shortlisted and now you've got to pay £300 to come for the dinner. Okay, it's very important. We're not going to, you know, it's not a little uh, issue there. If you, if you are shortlisted, it's rather awkward and you think, well, I've got to now pay a lot of money. So we make that free of charge. And what we do ask is that you share your experience or your projects with other associations. Okay, and that's how we do that with the success stories. That's proved very, very um, popular indeed. And you can come to the Congress with which the Association Awards is co-located, talk about your projects as well. So it's very rewarding indeed, and you're putting a lot into your sector. Um, seminars, we have these each month except for July and December. And we have some study missions, uh, sometimes called FAM trips, but with education. We've done those to Dubai. We've done those to India this year as well, towards the end of the year. And then virtual events is the thing we're doing this year, which are not physical events. They're just virtual as well. So that's, that's some of the things that we offer. The events, except for these monthly events, they are paid for. But everything else is free of charge for membership. Our next big congress is the World Congress in Antwerp. We've got about um, a third national associations, a third international, and a third European associations. If you're doing any work abroad, this is a good event to consider. 
Uh, there are a lot of associations coming. There'll be about 500 of us there, um, and it's a, a wonderful city as well, of course. Um, just on the publishing side, we talked, I talked earlier about the videos that we've got. We've also got interviews as well, just sort of five to seven minute interviews of CEOs and other important roles um, within associations. Publications, I mentioned we've got the magazine and case studies, the reports and our books. First book we published is on the membership database. And uh, we've got that available. If you want information about that, please come and see me afterwards. So moving on to the event here, emergency procedure, <gasps> Lucy, no, fire exit, left here, and then left again, okay, outside, out the front door is the fastest way out. Um, for the event evaluation, um, we will send you an evaluation email tomorrow, please complete that, and those of you who complete that will then get the slides and the handouts. Okay. Um, the other thing to remember is that you do need to join at associationexecutives.org to get those. You will have been asked to join uh, when you registered and possibly reminded. So please make sure you register there. Okay. It's important for us to have your information to know what your interests are so that we can create the right events for you. Okay. Um, timings today. So we're starting, um, David will start at half past, five, half past three and uh, cover about half an hour. Uh, of the presentation, maybe a bit longer, and then we're going to have questions, and this is a very long question. So in the previous one we did, uh, at the end of last year, a lot of questions, we could have gone for a lot on longer than an hour. So we'll try and keep it to an hour, and the questions are very important. We will have the microphone come around with the microphone, so please wait for the microphone to come to you. We are webcasting this live, so if you don't want to mention your organisation, don't. If you have a problem with your voice being recognised, then if you could write your question down and hand it to Lucy. No, 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 that's a serious point. Um, and, and do that towards, if you were in the question time, because your questions may well have been answered. We have already given David some questions um, from, from uh, delegates here, some of which he's going to cover anyway, but um, just in case not. And I well may have some uh, questions from the audience who are watching, uh, and then I'll pick those up and ask them as well. So you may see me ask lots of questions and wonder why am I getting, get, getting to, to ask these, okay? Um, and then that, that video will then be available for you to then review afterwards in case you can't remember what was said, okay? So you don't have to write down everything. And then um, at quarter past five, we're going to have drinks and then a little show round. Now, for those of you who either have event responsibility or have staff that report to you that have event responsibility, please consider a five to ten minute show round of the venue here. This event is hosted and only by it being hosted are we able to do this free of charge. So please do have a look. It's an amazing venue. It's been uh, refurbished but also a lot of facilities added to it over the last two, three, four years. Um, I was shocked at, 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 at how much change there has been in that period. So please do consider. Rhiannon who's there at the desk at the back, we're delighted to take you around and she'll do that just at um, about 5.20, so about five minutes after we finish and, and start the drinks. Okay? She also has some, some uh, brochure type things for you. Um, to take away if you're interested. Please pass them on to colleagues if you could. Um, so I'd also like to thank Be There Global, who've been our webcast partners now for nearly eight years. They're exceptionally good, and again, we couldn't do it without their, their, their kindly offering it uh, as a supported thing. Please do consider them for your webcasting. They are truly excellent, and they've supported us everywhere we've done things. We've got some of their customers in the room nodding at the moment, which is very good. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce now David Smart. He's the Managing Director of Softworks. We've known Softworks for about nine years. Um, they are experts in uh, security and compliance. Um, they have actually a deep knowledge of associations and have a lot of associations as clients. Um, David's not going to be too techy. He's the Managing Director, so talk at, at every level. And of course, he, he'll probably say that he'll leave you with more questions than you came with. I don't think that's the case. I think he will leave you with, still, you'll still have other questions, but you will have some answers, okay? So it's very complex. I'll hand over to David, and thank you very much for presenting. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I need to be out of here by... 
5.30, just to now let to start with, because the Q&A went on quite a long time last time. Um, I think the idea is we do have a long session uh, for Q&A at the end, but, I mean, if there's odd questions, it's, I don't think it's against the law to, to ask one. Um, I've already got some questions before we've even started this time, which is, is good. Um, very quickly, a, a little bit about myself, really, and perhaps declare my... Um, interest in GDPR. Um, I don't sell GDPR per se, whether you could or not, but um, I've uh, been the managing director of Softworks for about 10 years, so we're an IT security company. Um, my interest in GDPR, and if you like data governance more broadly, came around a couple of years ago uh, as an organisation with about um, 500 clients and our business is data, is integrity of that data, security of that data. Uh, when the regulations came around, um, we wanted to know more about it, uh, to be honest, out of self-interest or, or self-preservation, if you, if you want to put it that way. Um, I've since done a lot of these chats and we've learned a lot about compliance. I guess, in some ways, from my perspective, uh, you may have been to a few of these things. I, I, I'm from a kind of business manager owner perspective. That might not be directly the same as you guys, but my, my interests start with my own organisation first. If you can imagine um, uh, any kind of hacker or someone breaking into our organisation, we always say it's slightly better than a bank um, because you can have the choice of 500 different uh, organisations to hack once you're in. Um, uh, Damien also mentioned something about uh, previous membership knowledge. Um, so about 10 years ago, I was involved in designing membership systems. We should actually have 70 offshore uh, developers in Colombo uh, doing just that. So I have some intrinsic knowledge on long-haul flights of, of the membership community. Uh, I want to stri strike the correct balance today um, around GDPR um, between, I guess, mm, Armageddon and um, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> 30 minutes is not a long time to talk about something that is really quite a complex subject uh, and actually the more you learn, the more you kind of need to learn or want to learn, certainly the journey we've been on for the last couple of years. Uh, and we're going to try and make it, well, I think I'm okay to move about, we're going to try and make it, because GDPR is pretty dull really, we're going to try and make it a little bit exciting in terms of just the facts and the fictions and uh, and get an understanding, engage an understanding of, uh, of who knows what with GDPR in the room. Um, just finally, before we get started, I mean, this is a question often, I think the ICO, so the Information Commissioner's Office, I'll say, I'll say ICO a lot today, and Elizabeth Denham, um, are really kind of keen to, to understand. I'm not asking for their benefit, I'm asking for mine, really, in this presentation. Get just a show of hands, who, straight shoot from the hip, who thinks GDPR is a good thing? That's not very many people. <laughs> so everyone else thinks GDPR is generally a bad thing or they're not sure? Not sure? I think it's lack of awareness at the moment. Yeah. Okay, okay, fine. Um, we, we asked ourselves this question many times over. Just kind of, I won't play the question answer game too long, but in terms of your, GDPR is all about privacy of individual. It's not about business per se, it's about the privacy individual. And, and, and many could argue, 20 years after the Data Protection Act, an awful lot has happened in society, let alone Facebook or the internet or anything else. So all of these things have kind of driven changes in, in, in data protection. Who, you don't have to raise your hands to all of this, but, but it's a thought process. Who, who, who's kind of been mildly annoyed about being phoned up or receiving an email from someone when they've never heard from them at all whatsoever and they've somehow got their information. Yeah. yeah. Um, who, 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 who's kind of been slightly embarrassed, maybe worked in a company where everyone got the wrong salary details or your bank sent your next door neighbour your, your, your bank statement or... So at different levels, really. Who, who's, who's been hacked? Who knows they've been hacked? There's lots of people who've been hacked and don't know they've been hacked, trust me. 
Okay, and then that goes along the level of you've actually lost something as well, so it, it hurts even more, it's a financial impact. Um, who, who, who's had the, it gets a little bit more personal here, you don't have to give me the details, who's had the medical records mixed up? Or the medical records of their children or their family? Yeah, there's a famous story of a guy in Germany um, who uh, was in remission for, for cancer treatment, I think had, had, had got through it, uh, and then fell ill a year or so later. Uh, this story is told by the ICO and also by uh, part of ours IT governance, so it's not one of those urban myths. And it's probably not a standalone story either. Uh, he went back to the hospital we treated and they looked at his record and said, oh, yeah, he's suffering from cancer. We'll give you some more treatment for that. And he actually died as a result of it. So, um, you know, for those that think, and to be honest, from a business perspective, running an IT security firm, when this first came out, we're kind of... We need this like a hole in the head. From, from an individual perspective, okay, and this is just a warm up really for the presentation, um, it's a good thing. You know, you, you, you need to think about it from your own perspective, uh, and business needs to change um, to, to, to accommodate. So, into the kind of seminar, if you like. Um, current view of GDPR. Lots of questions, so we'll get straight into it. We're all doomed. I was going to change this to we're all bored, because <laughs> it's an awful lot what we see as well. Um, anyone can remember that? Yeah, IT is going to save the world. Luckily, we did, just. Or is it all just another IT con? Yes. <laughs> you never know, though, do you? Um, or GDPR, it's, it's kind of life, Jim, but not as we know it. Um, I'd say that's a, a safe option where you should be thinking. Um, I don't want to defend the IT industry in the middle here, but you sh certainly shouldn't be panicking. Uh, got lots of questions. So, keeping it interactive. Hands up all those very brave people who are in the green box. Good, you're all in the right room. Hand up, hands up all those that are in the, the red box. Really brave and honest. Good. It's a bit like skiing this, I think. You know, you're either, a, it's your first time there or you're, you're an expert skier. The other 95% of us are kind of intermediate and you're either in the kind of green or orange, which I think is where most people are. So we're going to talk about uh, the facts and the fiction and the grey areas in between, and there are some grey areas, and the ICO are, are well aware of this. This is not statute yet. It will be coming on the 25th of May next year, um, and it will be tested in law. This year. Uh, sorry, this year. <laughs> Thank you for the correction for all the people <laughs> watching outside. I mean, I stood here in 2017. Um, yes, 25th of May, 28th. I should know that bit at least. Um, but there are still some grey areas, and hopefully we're going to discuss those today, uh, give you some more information, and point you in the right direction. I, I've done this a few times now, and um, I kind of get bored of hearing myself just repeat the same things over again. So what, what we've decided to do, um, and for the person that gets every single one right, um, we're just going to have a bit of a kind of game here to, to test the knowledge and of our understanding of where you, where you think you are with GDPR. Try not to throw too many curveballs or clever questions in there. Some of them are really straightforward. But these are the types of things that we've got back over the last couple of years. And trust me, we've had some interesting ones that, you know, well, it doesn't affect me. It can't do. Um, it affects you more than anybody. So we've got probably the, the most 10 common things that we tend to hear. Uh, in no particular order, by the way. Um, what I'd like you to do, I mean, you've all got pencils and papers in front of you, just scribble down one to ten. These are true or false. You don't have to tell anybody. You don't even have to do it. If you're at home, you can do it. Um, but it's just kind of make it a little bit more interesting. So GDPR is mainly for consumers. does not affect the business-to-business -business environment. These are simply true or false. GDPR will no longer apply when, if... We leave Europe, European Union. 
GDPR only relates to online or digital data records, i.e. not boxes of paper, law firms' records. If you mainly do business outside of Europe, then GDPR doesn't affect you, doesn't apply. GDPR is a regulation rather than the actual law. True or false? Under GDPR, if you do not collect the actual name of the person, then GDPR does not apply. Does anyone, know, does anyone not know what a data protection officer is, just before I ask the question? I, 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 under GDPR, um, you may or may not need a data protection officer, and that's someone who's responsible within your organisation for this and other uh, regulations. But the question here, which is a common one we get back, is you only need one if you've got more than 250 employees. This is quite a good one. We hear this a lot. We do a lot of stuff in the cloud and hosting. Uh, all of our data is stored in the cloud, so it's not really our problem. It's their problem. It's Microsoft problem, whoever. This is a good one. Normally, perhaps cynically, the whole reason we're in the room because everyone talks about fines and multi-million, billion euros. And, but basically, if you get a security breach, you have to report report it within 72 hours, and report it to the ICO, be specific. The 72 hours for those that haven't worked it out is a long weekend. We do a lot of this working out in IT because things tend to go down on a Friday and you find out on a Monday. 72 hours is not a very long time. And finally, um, which I think this might be interesting for, for a lot of you guys in membership database world, uh, once, once GDPR starts this year, um, 25th of May, uh, you can only market to new members or prospects if you have their consent first. Okay. So, for the person, uh, I'd say for the pers person who gets closest to 10 out of 10, as we play this in internally a little bit, um, my colleague here carried this bottle of wine all the way in from Middlesex. <laughs> If, you don't, if someone doesn't win it, we'll have to drink it. So let's step through these. Um, actually, uh, let's put your hand up. GDPR is mainly for consumers. It does not affect the B2B environment. Uh, true, hands up. Excellent. Good. Good start. GDPR will no longer apply when, if we leave Europe. True or false? So, everyone heard of the Data Protection Bill? So it's the UK version of GDPR. So whilst we're in the European Union, we'll be covered by this regulation. Um, the the, 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 we've got a um, slide on it. The um, Data Prote Protection Bill has already been published and it was talked about 12 months ago that it was almost gonna replicate GDPR. So if and when we leave Europe, we still want to do kind of the same thing as them. So we've written our data protection bill with a few derogations. So it's almost the same. GDPR only relates, well, I've given you an answer to that one. Anyone get that wrong? GDPR only relates to online or digital. Did everyone get that one right? In that it's wrong, yeah. So. The next question we normally get from this is, so everyone know what a subject access request is? So in the new world, someone, you can have them now, but in the new world you can have a member um, want to, all of their data are raised, they want to know where they appear. Uh, and for example, if you're a law firm or something like this, you may have warehouses full of manual paperwork that's not digitized you need to get that digitised before May the 25th. By the way, this is kind of on, on the dates thing. It's on which, not from which, you need to be compliant May the 25th. 
So all of this needs to be in order by May the 25th. Don't start working on it from the May the 25th. So again, like all of, um, uh, I guess, new things, um, industries pop out anywhere. And I, I've got no uh, affiliation with any of these organisations, but I tend to collect names because I get asked questions. Organisations, firms like Boxit, for example, um, do uh, storage scanning services that they're already working with a number of different people to archive everything digitally. You mainly do business outside of Europe. GDPR doesn't really apply. Hopefully everyone got that one right. So if you're outside Europe and you only deal outside of Europe, okay, and you don't deal with anybody in Europe, then directly GDPR is not going to apply to you. But if you're in Europe and you deal with people in Europe, certainly will. If you're in Europe and deal with people outside of Europe, it will. If you're outside of Europe, for example, the US, and you deal with people inside, by the, when I keep saying people, I mean data subjects to be specific. In Europe, um, it will apply. Uh, this is a slight trick question, really, because um, the difference between the data um, GDPR and the, and the Data Protection Act is that the Data Protection Act is a directive uh, and GDPR is a regulation. So regulation will automatically become law on the 25th of May. Um, the Data Protection Act, which is a directive, is uh, local territories, countries, need to form their own laws and regulations to make it the law. But one of the things that um, the ICO will speak a lot about is that you know, when the clock ticks over midnight, this is law. So they're one of the same thing, really. Unfair question. Everyone get this one right? So in GDPR speak, we talk about data subjects and we talk about personal data, personal data identifier, right down to an IP address. So if you're picking up, if, if I can find out who you are via your IP address or biometrics or anything, I don't need your name. That's qualified as personal data. And by the way, in terms of a definition, just left field for a minute for GDPR, if you want to know what processing means, it includes looking at. Come back to that later. Uh, right, okay. Data protection officer, if you have more than 250 employees. That's incorrect. Um, it was originally in the first draft of GDPR uh, because I think actually it made a bit more sense. Um, there's three reasons today um, why you'll need a data protection officer. You're either a public sector authority. You're dealing with, I'll get the phraseology exactly right, um, large systematic processing of data or special categories of data. So the obvious follow-on question from that is define large, define systematic. Uh, there's um, a working party of part of this regulation called Working Party 29. We'll give you all these resources at the end. And they produce guidance on particular grey areas. Um, there's a 30-page document on data protection. It's all public domain. 30-page um, document on... Um, data protection when you need a data protection officer and if I wander around too much um, I think it gives you various examples within um, within that uh, document as to when you might need a data protection officer or not uh, all of our data stored in the cloud is not our problem is your problem but what this opens up is the Pandora box uh, and another area of confusion, and the working party have, have written another guidance document on this between the controller and the processor. So everyone understands the concept of the controller and a processor. It's probably one of the more straightforward areas that can get quite complex. You can be a controller and a processor, not for the same set of data. Uh, and, uh, and probably the easiest Microsoft's view, though. So, so quite simply, if you're using Microsoft in the cloud, you're the data controller, they're the processor. But the difference, the, the, the definition of uh, the processor is really 
the means and purposes for processing that data. So here's a slight nuance for this. For example, if um, I ran my own jewellery business on, online and I used PayPal um, to collect the money, is PayPal a processor or a controller? PayPal is a controller. They're determining the means upon which they collect that money. I just want the money collected. You must report a security breach to the ICO within 72 hours. Who thinks yes? Yes, but not necessarily. And this is really a um, key point to learn from an IT security firm. Uh, Article 33, it's a couple of pages on security breaches, not just to the ICO, but also the data subject. If, as an organization, you have taken appropriate technical and organizational security measures, and the level of privacy exposed for the individual is not particularly significant, then you don't have to tell the ICO. You don't have to um, report it to the data subject. And there's some examples, most of them, by the way, that the examples they've given that you do. I'm not to read all of these out. Medical records, um, hacked, yes you do. Um, you send an email to the wrong person but the email's encrypted, no you don't. Um, so, some, uh, everybody in the room heard, heard of something called Cyber Essentials? Okay, so UK government standards, been around for two or three years. Um, all us IT people kind of snubbed our nose at it because we thought it was a bit noddy and basic. However, for you know, everyone outside the IT sector that wants a bar to hit in terms of compliance and a stamp, Cyber Essentials which looks at the five key areas of your cyber posture is a very, very good start. Cyber Essentials Plus is the kind of same thing with a vulnerability scan and penetration test. This will test whether you've taken appropriate technical and organizational measures. And the ICO actually give an example, an example in the regulation in terms of technical, it's encryption. In terms of organizational, well, what do they mean? What's one of the biggest problems, and we sell a lot of IT security protection stuff, what's one of the more difficult problems to resolve, might you think? People. Us. Once you put every single layer of security in that you possibly can, still, when you get that email come through that says, you owe the inland revenue £1,826.72. We sell a lot of phishing software, and I can tell you that gets a 70% hit rate. And the only thing to beat it that gets an 80% hit rate is when they owe you money. People can't open it quick enough. Um, so what they mean by uh, uh, organisational is train your staff, train yourselves. And I'm not talking about going on a week's course. Um, there's an industry now out there of training bodies that's all online that can be run by IT admins. It's very, very effective. It's very, very cheap. We actually, on a different campaign a year or so ago, um, we promoted um, security user training. We use a company called Know Before, but we promoted this as the most effective and least expensive thing you could and should do. Well, it's kind of clever marketing speak, but really it is. Um, GDPR, uh, oh, right, okay. Who got this one right? So this is the chicken and egg question, and I've already got this question before I stood up here, which kind of says, we got this membership database. Let's start off with the simple stuff, really. We want to add new members to this membership database. Um, but it's a bit chicken and egg, because how do we talk to them if we haven't got their consent to talk to them before we talk to them? Uh, the best port of call, and I'm not um, 
I don't know if they're even in the room, the Direct Marketing Association have done a superb job with the ICO for the last 12 months of knocking this backwards and forwards for clarification, because of course, if we can't market with people we haven't met, that's a multi-million pound industry stopped overnight. Um, so of course, we can market to people we haven't met. There's seven um, bases uh, for lawful, what they call lawful processing, with, processing within uh, GDPR. Only one of them's consent. Okay, the other ones, if you're a criminal, public sector. Uh, one of them, uh, which the DMA quote a lot, is legitimate interest. If it's a legitimate interest for your business to promote itself correctly, and we'll come back to that bit, to new members and prospects or customers or clients or whatever, perfectly able to do it. I've got all the resources at the end. Check out the DMA website. They would advise you to take an LIA, uh, I think it's a legitimate interest assessment, balance scorecard. The big thing about GDPR is you need to have thought through it and, and written it down. So for example, for a data protection officer, if you kind of get back to your office and you sit around the table and you go, oh, I really don't think we need one. We've convinced ourselves we don't need one. That's fine. Document the fact that you've had the conversation and why you don't think you need one. Because that would be worth its weight in gold if and when you find out that you probably should have had or even need to. Um, we can talk about, I'll cover it off in the questions in, in terms of uh, membership databases and what I've got and what I should do and what I shouldn't do because I think that'll be a big area of discussion at the end. It, it, it was, we did this in, in Manchester before Christmas. So, anybody get 10? Anybody get more than seven? More than eight? Anybody want to carry a heavy bottle of wine home? More than eight? Well done. Don't know if you drink white wine. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Round of applause for the gentleman. We, we don't normally get many more than get about six or seven right, so well done. Um, we... Um, um, we print some of these booklets. You can get them off our website online. Unfortunately, we couldn't carry. Well, well we probably could, but we chose not to carry 50 today. So um, it's all online and help yourselves to those. Okay. You're either now kind of somewhere between slightly bored, slightly confused and slightly concerned is generally where we sort of get to. Let's just cover off a couple of more slides and then, you know, I promise what we're going to talk about is, well, what the hell am I meant to do next, uh, practically? Uh, right, so we're going to skate through some of these fairly quickly. Uh, Wikipedia is not far out in this case, really. The three things to, to think about here, it's about individuals, it's about the unification of a, a regulation across Europe. Uh, and um, if you want to read it, it's actually, you know, it's not the most exciting read in the world, but you don't need to be a qualified barrister to understand it. Uh, it's about 260 pages. Uh, difference between a directive and regulation, we've already covered that off, covered this off, and everyone knows, hopefully, that it's on which, not from which, the 25th of May, I learned something today, this year, um, that it becomes law. Uh, this is, again, all public domain. This is the Data Protection Bill um, first published. There are a handful of what they call derogations, if you like, special differences between GDPR and the UK version of GDPR, which is the Data Protection Bill. Um, they're nothing outrageous. They're nothing particularly different. Every um, territory, local territory, it is, uh, has triggered another thought in my head. Uh, every local territory is um, encouraged to apply their own derogations within reason. Every local territory, every country, by the way, and this is uh, an in in important piece of information for you, is also encouraged to build its own set of standards. So for those that are familiar with standards like ISO 27001 or 9001, BSI kite marks, um, 
you know, everybody kind of wants to know what the standard is and where to get to. And, 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 and you know, if we achieve that and we tick that box, even though this should not be a ticking box exercise, um, we, know, we know we're there. Unfortunately, with GDPR at the moment, whoever um, you talk to, you know, no one's going to give you a compliance certificate. This year, maybe next year, I know that the ICO are looking at particular um, levels of compliance around data seals, which I think will be very useful because then everyone can kind of drive towards the same thing. The closest that exists today, I um, can't remember the exact number of it, but is BSI PIMS, which is a British Standards Institute Personal Information Management System, which is closely aligned, and or if you've got ISO 27001 from a security perspective, you're already a long way down the road. I'm going to go through some of these quite quickly now. So if you thought it was just a UK problem, I've been showing this slide for a while now, it's probably a year old. This is what the states think about GDPR and Microsoft, I'm sure everybody's heard of Microsoft, are doing a lot around GDPR and have just launched a whole new range of services and products. Everyone's familiar with Office 365, for example, or Microsoft 365, Microsoft 365 Enterprise Edition now also covers compl compliance and security. Could talk about it for four hours in itself. The thing that most people start these presentations with just to get the attention is, oh my God, you're going to get fined to death and the world's going to end. When we talk about this, and we talked about our own organisation, we turn over about four million. Um, if we got fined thirty thousand pounds, you know, really hurt, you know, we'd all bend down to pick it up. We'd probably survive for another day. Now, this very much depends on what your business is. For us. Last one out, turn the lights off, yeah. particularly if it's public domain. We've just explained to everybody who wants to know that the data is not safe with us. It's reputational damage, and that, that might be true for you guys. We, th there's too much focus on whether it's, tw I think it's, whether it's 20 billion euros or 4% of turnover. You know, it's kind of nonsensical. It's about your reputation at the end of the day. Uh, this is Eliz Elizabeth Denham, and I, I summarise this towards the end. If there's today is, is, is as much about practically learning things, what it is and what to do about it, as is developing a mindset. And we started off at the outset by saying, well, who thinks it's important? Who's been hacked, embarrassed, threatened with their life? We all kind of think it's probably a good thing. The best way we describe it is a kind of new normal. We've thought about it a lot. So if you walk past a building site in London now and everybody looked like um, these, these guys, uh, best picture I could find. Um, but this is what the health and safety industry has done to, to, to construction. You know, this is the new normal. You wouldn't think anything different. The new normal is to put data integrity, data governance at the heart of your organisation, central to what you do. This, you know, the more that you can allow that thought to develop in your mind, as opposed to, this is another box we've got to tick, and once we've done that's good, we can get on with running our business, um, the harder you'll find the journey. Okay. What to do about it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do kind of two levels of things here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the recommended process um, roadmap to follow in terms of GDPR journey. And when I've spoken to you about that, I'm then going to talk to you about the least you should do and what you certainly shouldn't do. So five steps towards... Uh, practical compliance and what we're going to do is just spend a couple of minutes on each one of these so board level sponsorship really if, if, if you're not the boss or CEO of your organisation I think most of you probably are in this room you know take this message back to your board to your CEO to the executive level because if they don't know it by now well they may have been on the moon but um, it probably better put if they don't realise 
that it's ultimately their responsibility. This is probably a bigger risk along with IT security than leaving all the doors open every time they go home at night. You need to get acceptance, understanding, and, and, and if you need it, you know, sponsorship through budget support. You need to establish at the early stage whether you're going to have a DPO or not. For some organisations that we dealt with, <laughs> and there's some big ones out there, you know, the, the, the moment the CEO has decided that they need a DPO, that's almost a sense of relief <laughs> because there's someone in the organisation that's solely and wholly responsible for this. We have, Softworks is, is, a, is a subsidiary of a large, larger group that deal with the government on a national basis, so we've had a DPO for quite a long time. Um, it, it makes quite a lot of sense to have a data protection officer or some kind of level of responsibility. There's an awful lot of small organisations that exist in the UK. Uh, the ICO are aware of this, and if, I, I will keep plugging the ICO. You know, I'm not commissioned from the ICO, I just think they're doing, trying to do quite a good job. So the I, ICO have dedicated helplines for small businesses. They have dedicated flowcharts, toolkits, all of these sort of things. If I was marginally critical about them, if you go on to take the ICO GDPR gap analysis online questionnaire, the first thing they'll ask you is about being a controller or processor. And you'll probably go, well, I kind of need to understand what both those are to answer the question properly. But this is a point that you really need to establish within your organisation. Without stating the obvious, if you get you know, three weeks, three months down the road, by the way, GDPR is going to go on long beyond 25th of May, um, within the UK, and it make you feel good, bad or indifferent, and these are independent surveys and results. I think there's about 30% of businesses in the UK that are, yep, we're in the green box, we're okay, nothing to worry about. So not just GDPR, but governance around data is going to continue to exist for some time. And we'll talk about consent and management and things like PECA and e-privacy that are all related when we, we talk about membership database in particular. Uh, gap analysis, this is the basic kind of IP, ICO um, step frame for a, through a gap analysis. It, it kind of is what it says on the tin, really. Uh, you, you need to go through this thought process either internally or externally um, to establish where you are or where you're not. Uh, data protection impact assessment, again, it's not mandatory, but for most organisations, um, it's a good, at least a very good thought process to go through. Here's an example of um, data protection impact assessment for um, both structured and unstructured data. So those, without getting too technical, this is obviously a bigger concern here. If you've got Microsoft 365 Enterprise Edition you, and you get a subject access request, you'll be able to find the information quite quickly. If you haven't got that or you've got unstructured data and most people have and it's all over the shop, ah, problem. How am I going to find it? You need to find it before you, need, before you actually need it and go through. Uh, and ultimately, what they call a data flow mapping exercise. I've heard these all called different things, but essentially it's answers all these questions here about where your personal data is collected from, who's accountable, uh, how long you've got it for, why you're keeping it. And attempts to answer all, all the questions that cover the regulation that you'd be asked anyway. So I'm sure that many of you haven't probably even started on that journey yet. Um, but that's the vanilla standard journey that um, most of you should be going on and as I say uh, we, we do a lot around security and compliance and you can go to our website I don't even think we've got it on here but you'll find us um, there's a lot of free useful resources information um, we're a kind of independent so we're not tied to any particular vendor um, but the ICO is also a good port of call the Information Commissioner's Office. What, what I started doing when I, when I was first asked to do this sort of stuff, um, you know, I printed off the regulation and read it and then read it and then read it again. 
and then read all the working parties because from my perspective it kind of needs to be from the horse's mouth so you know, I won't send you to 50 different GDPR specialist tool companies because they'll have their own bias all our resources will point you to the National Cyber Security Centre, to the ICO, or to some independent authoritative body. Okay, I sense we need to uh, get onto the questions, but I just want to cover off, finally, um, the very least you should be doing that I really want to encourage you to do, and importantly, what you should not be doing. So, do. Kind of perhaps not overnight like a light switch, but, but develop this new way of thinking. I think for you guys particularly, really, when I worked in the, 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 you know, the membership space before, um, your membership, that, that data, that is the value of your business. You, know, you are looking to um, provide a professional service, add value, um, and be an authoritative body in, in, in that organisation. So you need to accept that data governance is a new normal, and, and you need to encourage your members it is as well. And I've emphasised that further, really, by, you know, embrace the concept. You'll hear a lot of this from Elizabeth Denham, but, you know, from my perspective, if I talk about all of the layers of security uh, uh, and all of the qualifications, accreditations my organisation has got, that should make you feel more comfortable about putting your data with me compared to someone who hasn't. You know, whether you're competing memberships or whatever your situation, your members need to be comfortable that when you've got their data, it's safe. One thing that I'll say now before I forget, I keep reminding myself things, is uh, an extension of what we're talking about today. Um, we haven't really suggested this before, but, you know, if I was running a membership association, I'd want to be providing best advice around GDPR. So if you wanted either us to stand in front of your members, you know, time's ticking and um, the diaries are full. Uh, but it, what, what I guess I'm trying to say is, you know, I think you should be sharing this to your memberships in a bundled or, you know, advice line or on your website or brochures or best advice. Sorry, it's a question. No, I think there's two ways out of that. I think most of the stuff that you'll read, including, you know, Microsoft's 48-page guidance on GDPR, starts off with a paragraph that says, you can't take us to court. <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that's kind of one. But, but the, other, the other is, you know, I, 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 I run a you know, business that ultimately seeks to make a profit, but the other one I, I, I would recommend is organisations like the ICO. You know, by all means, say, talk to Softworks guys. They seem to know what they're talking about. They've been doing it for a while. But if there was certainly around a particular regulation, you know, I need to know if I want a DPO or not, then, you know, there's a 30-page document on DPOs developed by Working Partner in 29 point them to it, advise them to get legal advice around the contracts if they like. But, but anyway, I think you know, there's a massive opportunity for you guys to be adding value to your own individual associations. You know, I, I know, because we deal with lots of industries in the private sector, that they're kind of all a bit like you. There's lots of full rooms at the moment with people scratching their heads. So people are hungry for this information and you know, it, 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 it's added value really. We've already covered that one off. We've already covered that one off. That's the Information Commissioner's Office. I think we've covered this one off. Cyber Essentials accreditation. Make yourself familiar with it. You know, this is not £5,000. This is £500. You know, it's a kind of, there's an element to do it yourself. You might need some advice. It covers five key areas of vulnerability. Um, it's the least you should be doing. We're an IT security company, so, so this is a bit of our pitch anyway, I guess, but um, I showed a slide about fines going up under the current Data Protection Act. Why do you think most organisations are being fined at the moment in the current world and or will be fined going forwards? If we just talk about the, the you know, take the wrong mindset, I need to avoid the fines, what do I need to do? Not, I want to put data at the heart of my organisation, I need to avoid the fines, what do you need to do? 
you probably don't need to spend three weeks crafting the best privacy policy statement the world has ever seen on your website. You do need to address your cyber posture. Most organisations are fined because they've been hacked. There's been a data breach or, the, or someone inadvertently has sent something out to someone else. That's why most organisations are, are fined. So if you want to avoid fines, focus on your security. Yep, you need to be able to deal with subject access requests. Yep, you do need a good privacy policy. Yep, 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 to all of these things. But security, as Elizabeth Denham will tell you, is intrinsically linked to GDPR. It's kind of why I'm standing here today, as I run a security firm. I think we've covered this off as well. It's not expensive. It's very effective. It's very engaging as well for your team. So this is a key example of something I think you should and could, whether it's through us or someone else, be offering to your members. I think it's something, you know, you're talking a pound a person a month. And it's very comprehensive with simulated phishing attacks. And where, where we've used this before, and we, we tend to get, oh, I don't know, I'm not so sure about that. And then it also includes the physical elements things. So you throw a USB in the car park and the finance director picks the USB up, it's classic stuff, sticks it in, thank you very much, you've been had. The IT admin's got a portal, seen who's picked it up, what IP address, pretty much in a 300 seat company, everybody knows that the finance director's just done something silly. Everybody's engaged, everybody's aware, and part of security awareness training now includes GDPR awareness, data governance what you should and what you shouldn't do. Uh, I, I, I can't take my laptop home tonight, so I'm going to send the whole lot to my private email address, an attachment with an Excel spreadsheet. It happens. It happens a lot. I think I said earlier to someone, my, my mother is um, president of, of the regional WI or something, and I just, <laughs> you know when you're not at work and you don't want to talk about work and you kind of think, we're going to meltdown when she says it's all, and I give this to her, and this is on mine, and we've got all this everywhere, and that's what the world's got to change. Uh, review privacy statement. Okay, so don't. I, when we started going to these presentations, uh, certainly from an IT perspective, it was very much GDPR, Armageddon, buy our stuff, you'll be safe. <laughs> um, but if you don't, you know, the world will end. You really you know, mustn't kind of leave in a state of panic, but don't ignore it. You know, whatever you've picked up today, don't just forget about it. Does anyone know what re-permission means? Anyone heard of re-permissioning? Anyone heard of Honda? Anyone heard of Flybe? So both, both organisations got fined last year for attempting to re-permission their data. And we'll come on to this at q and I'm certain. Repermissioning your data, or I think I've heard someone in America call it up substituting. Essentially, what it means is oh, this is what Honda did. Um, and, and I've got to be honest, you know, two years ago we almost did it ourselves. We've got this database of customers, prospects, mixed bag of stuff, and uh, there's this new regulation coming down the line. <coughs> mm, okay, let's get ahead of the game. Let's mail everybody. You know, maybe include, and why don't you buy this at the bottom? But let's mail everybody and say, hey, remember us. Um, we're good guys. Uh, there's this new regulation coming down the road. By the way, we're just checking that it's okay that we keep you on our mailing list. And we keep communicating with you. Was that with a request to confirm back? Or just... That's called repermissioning, okay? It's called repermissioning, and this is less about GDPR, more about PECA. You should have had permission in the first place. <laughs> How on earth did you get that data in the first place? And if you don't know, you shouldn't have it, because you should have got it correctly in the first place, through correct marketing, through opt-in, through the telephone preference service. You should have communicated with... Uh, clear opt-in or opt-out. If you're confident that you've followed privacy electronic communications regulation, that's been around since about 2009, and that's before this, and it's to do with marketing. By the way, it's being rewritten. It's going to be launched this year as e-privacy, as if it wasn't complicated enough. 
if you're certain that when you originally got this information, you got it correctly, then you haven't got anything to worry about. You shouldn't be going to repermission anyway. If you only contact people who have given you their business card, is that implicit permission? Business cards is a, is a, is a good classic question. Um, you take that business card, you put it in your, what they call a kind of Rolodex, yeah. or you're in your CRM system, it's data and you're processing it. They're a data subject, you're processing it. You keep it in your pocket forever and a day and you might ring them in three years, I'd say it's not covered by GDPR. And by the way, you know, your Christmas card list between families is not, when we talk about, GDPR talks about data subjects and personal data. Doesn't talk about B to B, C to C, doesn't even talk about EU citizens. Talks about data subjects and personal data. We, 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 we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about consent in, in Q&A, um, I, I'm certain. Um, but but the, the key there is, you know, don't go and do what you think is a good idea and um, try and re-permission your database. The, the classic example, um, we, it's in the industry we call it Weatherspoons. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Weatherspoons quite a um, well-known CEO. So uh, uh, in July last year, uh, Weatherspoons got 750,000 personal data records. They deleted the lot. They didn't know where they got them from. Uh, to to add, add, just to slightly add to that, in 2015, for those that don't know, Weatherspoons were hacked quite badly. Uh, and then they come to continue to collect this data and then they don't know where they've got it from, and then they've gone, <laughs> delete, start again. I wouldn't recommend it, slightly odd. Wasn't in the boardroom when the decision was made. I think they do a lot on social media, certainly a lot with credit cards, so don't know how that's gonna work going forwards. Wouldn't suggest that at an extreme scale, but equally, if you've got a database which you've acquired from all over the place over a number of years, you need to be clear. The other thing to be clear about is, is communication with new prospects and with existing members. Okay, so if they're existing members, presumably they've signed some form of agreement, whatever shape, form, with your organization as a membership form, uh, some kind of low-level contract which basically uh, then allows you in terms of lawfulness of processing to communicate with them backwards and forwards under legitimate interest or under contract. Contract is one of the others. So for example, we're an IT security firm, people give us all their data and we communicate with them backwards and forwards all the time around our business and send them marketing. Um, that's as part of the contract and as part of the legitimate interest. So I think this, this point about the repermissioning is the most important question in the room. Certainly it seems to be online. So if you've got permission from somebody to communicate with them already, a member, okay, or a, a, a contact, and you then email them and say, we already have your permission for this. So we already have permission. They already have permission. They know when they had it, when the person joined, or when they subscribe to something, and they know what they agreed to at that point, they still could get re-permission. Yeah, but you're not technically re-permissioning them. The question you've got to ask yourself is, when I first ever communicated with them, did I do that in the correct way under the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulation? Nothing to do with GDPR. Yeah, so and if the answer to that is yes, then you can continue to communicate with them. And under the legitimate interest, because, you know, presume, well, I think it's, most people here could say, you know, what is their legitimate interest, but mm. they're, they're communicating with people Mm. Who they have legitimate yeah. Yeah. I, I, sector based. Yeah. They can do yeah. that. Yeah. So, right, here we are. And they could, they could do it as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, you know, this, this, it fits into two or three areas for, for you guys. If, if you've got a membership database and, you know, all of those members are properly signed up to your association, um, then as part of that contract between each other, you're processing their data. 
That's the lawful basis of processing is that you've got a contract, an agreement, call it what you like, you've got something that says I've joined this and therefore you can come backwards and forwards to me. And that includes marketing under legitimate interest. If you talk about, okay, so that's my existing base, but now I want to attract new people, maybe we're going into a new territory or we've got a new service or something else, how do I do that? Um, that is under GDPR, is under legitimate interest as a marketing exercise. So think direct marketing association, what's the advice and guidance, legitimate interest for marketing, lawful basis of processing for existing clients is your contract. The key thing here is to have you know, 10,000 people and you definitely know where 5,000 came from but you, you don't know how you got the other 5,000. <coughs> Depends what's written on the online application form. <laughs> no, dress, telephone. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 I, I, again, not kind of key areas, but, but I would suggest, um, you know, there's some best practice or paragraph of what, what am I joining? What am I going to get out of it? What do you want from me? What, what's the mutual kind of binding agreement here? How do I get out of it, by the way? still have to have that form, um, even if it's online or whether it's, um, uh, you know, it was physical in the first place, i.e. I'm thinking data that's gone back 20 years or so. That original joining, because that's what you talk about. With the my, my, my short yeah. answer to that would be yes, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I, and bear in mind that's got less to do with GDPR and more to do with a regulation called Privacy Electronic Communication. But uh, uh, again, it is a plug for a company I know nothing about and have nothing to deal with. And, I, and, and um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of these organisations about. <coughs> I don't want to call this a loophole, but I guess it is. I think the Wildlife Trust did something like this. So um, I've got this 5,000 records. Not sure how I got them, so I'm kind of on a sticky ground for GDPR, and, but I want to keep dealing with them, but I can't email them to re-permission them, so how can I achieve that? It's kind of two clever ways at the moment, I'm trying to be clever here. Um, I think it's the Wildlife Trust actually went back to sending hard copy brochure mailer it's not covered under privacy electronic communication regulation. The other option, so long as they're TPS cleared, everyone knows what TPS cleared, I'm an IT guy, not marketing guy, telephone preference service. So long as they're TPS cleared, ring them up. And there are agencies out there, as you might imagine, it's sprouting industry. There are um, telephone sales agencies that will ring up and requalify your data on your behalf and they'll say exactly what you shouldn't do in terms of a privacy you know a, a, an email under PECA obviously you need to be clear that TPS TPS clear yeah in terms of like registration forms and stuff we we don't necessarily have it sort of clear when they register but we sort of have a, a tick box and then sort of a you agree to our sort of terms and conditions by register and I guess if in our terms and conditions these kind of policies are sort of implemented, then that's okay. It doesn't, or does it have to be sort of on that application form, a clear sort of paragraph, a couple of paragraphs about this sort of? I, I mean, you, the, I mean? The, the answer to give to this is, you know, a year ago, no one was thrown in their arms in the air about the Data Protection Act. Yet I'd imagine it should be in, you know, some, some reference to it within all of your terms and conditions. You know, so we're looking at an involvement of that. We're not looking at writing war and peace and stapling it on the back of something, whatever the lawyers tell you. Yeah. Um, so the association I work for, we have a relatively large database with lots of records in it. Um, a, a large percentage of those records or a percentage of those records are what I would call lapsed members. So they were a member at a point in time. They are no longer a current member but we obviously still store electronically their data. Are there um, 
time rules around how long you can keep that and can you still communicate with LAPS members? We currently do. Are there any sensitivities okay. around I'll, that? I'll, I'll answer that the other way around. Can you still, com can you still communicate with them? depends what they signed up to and how they did in the first place you know so if you were clear with them that you know we may communicate you communicate with you once your membership has lapsed um, then it's fine to go back in terms of well some of these so what what you've hit upon here is is almost at that absolute core rationale for gdpr and that is you know we've got a load of kind of lapsed data here so you shouldn't have it. So in a new world, when someone signs up to, you, to, to your organisation, you need to tell them what data you're collecting, how you're collecting it, what you're doing with it, how long you're going to keep it for. And things like, as long as is required, is not good enough. Um, the, 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 again, it, you know, GDPR is a bit of a mindset, really, and just the more transparent you can be, you know, this is what we're aiming to do. You can look at our privacy policy. You know, we're aiming to help support, educate businesses in the UK around IT security and compliance. If you don't want to be part of that, don't join, down, don't join our website. Don't put your details in. You know, we won't communicate with you. But if you do, this is what we're trying to do. It, it's about transparency. I think I just, to finish this off, I think I had one more. <laughs> yeah, uh, two more. Right, uh, uh, just to focus, I don't want to kind of open another Pandora's box, but supply chain stuff. So not only have you got to get your own act sorted out from a GDPR perspective, you best know who you partner with for any of your services. So maybe you've got a software development company that builds your systems or hosts your systems or a marketing company that manipulates your data. Okay, they will either be a controller or a processor for you. In either case, you need a contract between you stipulating who's doing what and why. Uh, the, one of the big changes under uh, GDPR as opposed to the Data Protection Act is the processor is now liable as well as the controller. So in kind of years of old, it's only the controller that's going to get hit, it's not the processor as well. So you need to kind of develop this understanding of control and process. And this is part of your original data flow map. Even if you just sat down with a piece of paper and you wanted to crack at it yourselves and say, this is what we do for a business. This is where data comes in. This is where data goes out. This is who else is, it, who else is involved. Okay, if we turn up or one of our guys turns up, that's the first thing they're going to sit down and go through with you. We did this at Cambridge University the other week. And I just kind of ended it, run out of flip charts. But you know, there's lots of tools and things to do this. I think, just because we're going into questions, I'm going to finish off here. These are, I think you're going to get copies of these if you fill the things out. These are um, lots of different resources. The DMA, I would suggest, I think, for you guys around marketing, permissioning, legitimate interest, um, is certainly uh, a good the direct marketing association, a very good place. I'm not a marketing expert. We just get to learn some of these things. It's kind of Q&A now. Uh, um, I think we've... <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, a simple question. Very small association, 80-odd member companies. What of the member companies' uh, officials that we hold the data? What of that is personal data as opposed to company data? Okay, really best quick way of answering this, probably explain it, is if I went to a one of these marketing companies that sells me lots of data. I, I want to do a marketing campaign. Stick with me for a minute. And I say, right, what I need is the company name. I need the company phone number. I need the IT decision maker's name. I need his email address. Okay? That's personal data. If I go to that same agency and say, I want the company name and I want the company number, none of that can be attributed to a data subject person, not covered by GDPR. Okay, so having gathered that 85 members individual representative information and I'm holding an event, can I share that information with a, another company that's going to run the event for me? 
share the information in terms of just the company? Well, or the individuals they within need the to company? Be, they need to be doing um, contacts. As soon as you put people in there, names, IP addresses, biometric, IP, anything that can relate to, let's just keep it simple and call it names for the moment. They say a name, and a, a name and an email address makes it personal data. Absolutely. So you just have that allowed in your policy, that's what you're saying? If you put a name in there, it's covered by GDPR. And if you're going to take that data and give it to someone else, you need to tell the person, okay, okay. what you're going to do with it. So it's all about, and, and sometimes it, you, you can imagine it, if you, if, if, you, if, you, if you view it from a personal individual perspective, it's much easier because you can imagine when well, I need to insure my car or my house or something, I don't want phone calls from people trying to sell me windows. You know, what information do you want from me and why do you want it? What are you going to do with it? Where are you going to send it? Who are you going to share it with? And if I want it back, can you assure me that I'm going to have all of it back? These are the rights of the data subject, the big core sort of area of GDPR. You might have answered this on, on what you've just been saying, but just to clarify on that point in terms of named individuals, if they have a generic email address, so I have a generic email address, which is communications at blah, 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 does that count? Um, even though it, that, those emails only okay. go directly okay. to I'll me, you, but it's I'll give you the generic. IT answer to that. I'll give you the short answer first, no. The slightly longer answer is I know you're probably going to set an alias up to that and you're going to get that in your email box. So, so we have, for example, I think, well, I don't know what we have, info at Softworks, sales at Softworks or something. Guess what? You know, there's three or four people that get that. So I would say in, in your best practice around transparency, this is what we're going to do when you fill this form out. You know, we're not saying we're going to take all of your data and sell, sell it to some Eastern Bloc hacking company, we're, we're going to say we're going to try and actively market you more. We, from your perspective, you're going to try and provide more value. And if you're going to use and uh, pass their data to someone else, presumably those members will get a benefit from that as well. So why shouldn't they want to? Okay, with regard to passing data to somebody else, we would take data from our, from our members and transfer that to other members who are volunteers, perhaps um, chairs of committees within a region. We send that securely to them, but ultimately that data, that file has left us and gone to them. What they then do with that file, save it on their computer or what have you, they use that data to communicate, that's fine. But if they experienced a breach, whose, whose responsibility is it? Because obviously it's our, the data has come from us, we've shared it, absolutely fine securely as best we can but if it then happens but our members are compromised hmm. I, where, I, I, I where imagine, is the line i imagine is that you're one? treating your individuals as processors without any clear instruction guidance or contract and they're just walking out in the street and saying who wants all this data i mean this smacks of my you know my mother's kind of wi scenario where you know oh, this laptop's not working anymore i need to borrow this one and you know mary's coming into this afternoon and we're going to work with that you know your day you know it, your data's all over the shop you, you you just can't have that and you know wh what you need at the very least if you're going to do your bring your own device or we we tend to go bring out your dead if you're going to let people use their own devices you need proper encryption security tools on those machines that you manage because it's your responsibility, you know, with their email addresses. This is really where I think it's very difficult for the kind of third sector and where they rely on private individuals and, and voluntary people. But, you know, you have to come back to where we started really. And suppose I like to donate money to cancer research, but I've got no interest in Battersea Dogs Home. I, I want to be sure that my date is not flight. I mean, that's a nonsensical example, but it can get a lot more serious, obviously. Okay. Um, I have a question about um, holding information, like financial data uh, and governance documents. So we have a lot of archives, um, our members from when we were founded, obviously it was paper then, and then it's moved to electronic. We have a list of our members in terms of who was appointed for our AGMs every year, and some we have on paper, some we have electronically. How, I mean, do we have to delete them? Do we keep them? And if we keep them, how long can we keep them for? 
Okay. So there's, it includes informing our members, lapsed members or resignations as well. Mm. But their name isn't there. So let's kind of deal with it. You, you've got some manual, some digital. Yeah. Okay. If, if, let's, let's assume we want to keep them all. Yeah. Okay. These need to be archived. Ele- ele- well, I would suggest you archive them electronically. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, when and if you get a subject access request, someone's got to go in the seed container and start looking, you know. So, you, so, so, so I would do that much. In terms of, again, really, what you're doing and why you're doing it, given that these people were, the members were acquired correctly in the first place from a marketing point of view, there should be no issue with you talking to them and saying, this is what we want to do, this is why we want to do it. I, 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 you know, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of repeating myself, but it, it's a key thing to get across. It's, it's about transparency. You know, this is not kind of hiding because we, you know, just tell them what you want to do and why you want to do it. And, and, it, and if you don't think it's a good idea, they probably won't think it's a good idea either. But if they think they're going to get value out of it, you're, you're going to get value out of it. Just informing them then? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, so within our organisation, you have to apply to become a member. They then give us reference details, like name, address, telephone number. How do we then contact these references? Because they personally haven't given us the information. Currently we email them, but they haven't given us consent to do that. So would you have to send out hard copies or...? That, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, because that comes down to... You know, almost steers towards your Christmas card list. You know, here's my references. I'm giving in them personally. Uh, I would suggest, I need to talk to our own HR. I mean, I, I would suggest as part of their joining process, um, it's their responsibility that they're providing you with that reference information. But equally, you are very clear what you're doing with that and by what you're doing with it, how you're collecting it, where you're storing it, how long you're going to keep it for. So it, 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 in a good example might be, you know, we will email this contact within two weeks. We will then delete this information. Okay. We currently keep all the references in hard copy. They don't get digitised. The rest of the information does, but not the references. So would we have to change our process now to make sure it's all... I, I, I would seek to, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. you know, in, in a world that is, is around digital transformation, and we deal with a lot of law firms, and they kind of hold their heads in their hands, really, because they've got, you know, we've got to store it in a warehouse for seven years. Um, it, it really needs to be archived. If you can imagine a scenario going forwards, and there's lots of different GDPR tools out there and technologies, but I'll give you an example of what's called a subject access request. So... I might go to um, the organisation that I get my house insurance with and I waited too long on the phone last time I spoke to them, so I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to be clever here. As soon as May the 25th, and I'm sure some other people will be doing this, we've got a little black book, subject access request. Thank you very much. Uh, and you know, there's ICO guidance here. There's a proper way to do it, everything you need to tell me, uh, and I need to be clear and convinced, and you need to provide evidence. Um, that, that, that's good from an individual perspective. From a... Let's take someone like a global insurance firm. You know, that possibly is Armageddon. So they're going to get, we, we deal with a number of these people, and, and they're going to get hundreds, if not thousands, of subject access requests. Not all disgruntled employees, but some people that just switch the mobile phone. So I'm now, I don't want my information with you anymore. And with these guys, I'll switch electric. So... Again, if you, without getting um, overly technical, if, if you look at your structured data through, for example, an email system or your unstructured data, which is, for example, we've got HR forms scanned in a filing system online, part offline, with detailed information, that's what we call unstructured data. So if I, for example, was a reference or my house insurance example, phoned you up and said, right, you know, I know you've got my information, here's a subject access request, you need to delete it, you need to provide evidence. There's only two ways you're going to do that as as a large organisation. You're going to employ an army full of people offshore somewhere who can do this for you, or you're going to buy a tool or technology to do it around around unstructured data. 
and I'm not going to pitch lots here, you can do your own Google research, but again, as with all industries, there's always, you know, someone can, and there's some very good tools and technologies out there, some super expensive for global insurance firms, others, uh, Microsoft Compliance Manager, it's now being bundled in as Microsoft 365 Enterprise Edition, um, you know, horses for courses in different size organisations. Hi, um, we are an organisation, an association for companies. So um, a company will apply, and then they'll list a number of our, a number of individuals that we then communicate with. Um, but a lot of the individuals we communicate with or have communicated with over time never actually signed anything. They were just kind of either forward, we got their information meeting them face to face, or our emails were forwarded on. So how is that kind of covered in this, and how would we need to get their permission? Um, in the future, or how, how many members? How many are we talking about? People, hundreds, thousands. So, well, I think so. We have about our membership database is about three hundred and fifty companies, and then within that, it varies from one contact to like okay. some of them ten or twelve. I, 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 I need to put out some kind of whatever the legal caveat words here. This is I'm running a security business. I'm not giving kind of giving you specific legal advice, what I would do if I was you, there was perhaps the easiest way to answer, most honest, transparent way to answer these questions. I'd phone them up. Okay. I'd phone each one of them up. You know, it doesn't take long to make 350 phone calls. You are in a rock solid, crystal clear position then. Be clear about what you're going to say them when you talk to them. You know, hi, have you heard about GDPR? Ooh, you know, this is why I'm calling you. This is the information that I'd like to get. As I said earlier, it's kind of a loophole outside of re-permissioning at the moment. Bear in mind, PECA, Privacy Electronic Communications Regulation, is, is currently being rewritten and will emerge. It was meant to come around 25th of May at the same time. I can promise you it won't, but it will come out this year um, as e-privacy. Just, sorry, again, to follow up on that then, if you're phoning them just to get that approval, do you then, then need to have a written record of the fact that you phoned them and on what date and what, that you've I got would, that verbal agreement? I would, and ideally I'd have that in what we would use, a CRM system or a membership system. Yeah. yeah. So, so the world you want to avoid um, is this fragmented, distributed Excel spreadsheet, everyone, everywhere. The world you want to aim for is consolidated... Single. So, I mean, when we were developing member system, membership systems, I, I, I had 100 um, software developers offshore in Sri Lanka, and um, you know, we used to write thousands of lines of code. I mean, I've been out of that business for a long time now, but I'm pretty sure, based on what I know about the software industry, you can go and buy very comprehensive, effective systems almost off the shelf as a service. So, you know, I'm not in the business of selling membership systems, but if you haven't got one, I'd imagine there's a plethora of I don't know if anyone's in the room. Normally, there's someone in the room that's selling them. There's a plethora of really good ones out there at an enterprise level and a, and, a, and a small user level, which is the way you want to run and drive your business. Because if you need to evidence anything, you don't want to have to try and find someone who's left the company or is it in that drawer or is it on that spreadsheet or is it on that laptop. That's basically what we're trying to resolve, avoid. Can I do a follow-on to that? I think if, if you're... Um, if you've got a CRM system for certain and some of the membership systems, you should be able to put your lead contact against that company. And I think it should be pretty easy to add those contact details to the same, you know, attach them to that same organization and then send them a standard template email saying, your details were provided to, uh, to us by lead contact. You know, we've got this here. And maybe they could then go and click through and add what they'd like to receive or... You tell them, this is what they've told us to receive. Could you confirm? So I think you should be able to do that by email if you've got a CRM system or an advanced membership system, reasonably advanced. Um, yeah, yeah. Talk to your tech people, see, see what can be done there. Because I think calling them might be a little bit difficult. But of course, you've then got to institute some sort of system to continue emailing them or to follow up with a call, really. Because it's not 350, it's potentially 3,500. You know, yeah, I mean, plus. but we, uh, mm. I, I, I understand. But, I mean, we deal with organisations that, you know, have got tens of thousands. Of, and, and I'm not saying, you know, outsource these, but uh, it's not overly difficult. If, if you're really unsure and you're between kind of weather spoons and let's wing it, 
Um, you know, you, you need to think practically. Certainly, I think it was about a year ago. I think it, I, I keep quoting. I think it's the Woodland Trust. It's public domain. Um, you know, took the opportunity to send a hard copy marketing brochure and email out. You know, quite expensive, but depends on the size of your organisation. Why not? I'd also, <coughs> I'd also again, I'm not marketing expert. Direct Marketing Association are marketing experts. Keep an eye on their website, bookmark them, and keep an eye on what happens with e-privacy. I've got two questions from the audience, my, my remote, the remote audience, if I may. One goes back to your very first slide, which is, um, if we stay in the single market, whatever that means, it is possible we may, may still uh, have to uh, comply with GDPR, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I, I think or if we don't leave at all. No, no, um, yeah, abso absolutely, who knows. Yeah. Um, the, I think the point of the question really is, um, certainly in the early days, go back about 18 months ago, is, well, we're coming out of Europe anyway, so I'll, 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 I'll cross this bridge when I need to come to it, but the chances are I won't need to come to it. So Matthew Hancock, who's the recently been promoted, um, happens to be my local MP as well, he's a minister for digital, thinks culture and sport now as well, um, very switched on guy, which I think is why he's been promoted, and his department produced the Data Protection Bill, published the Data Protection Bill probably about six months ago, which is the UK version in anticipation of us leaving the European Union. Um, and why does it almost mirror the GDPR? Because guess what? We'd like to deal with Europe. So it really is a way of saying, but yeah, if we, for whatever reason, don't leave Europe, there will be no great repeal bill that repeals all of these bills, GDPR included, and I guess in some way, shape, form, we'll, we'll carry on. But I, um, I don't know. I'd imagine at some point we're going to leave Europe, sort of define that statement. The question I just had also is, um, do you have any views on how photographs of people of members, perhaps at events or in other ways, you know, ought to be dealt with? Yeah, uh, I, I think, again, if they, obviously a photograph of somebody is, 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 you can easily find out who, well, to a certain extent, you can find out who they are, certainly with AI and facial recognition, you might even be able, you know, if you really wanted to, what I would do, so if I'm running an organisation like this, is very clearly, very transparently, very, very simply, detail out this is what we're doing today, this is why we're doing it, you, your face may appear, your information may appear, if you do not want it to, do not enter the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just going to ask about your name and email address, because you've put up that yeah. there for us to see. So if I email you tomorrow... And then I don't want to speak to you again for six months. I think of a question, I email you tomorrow. But next time I type David in my search yeah. box for my, and it auto fills your email address. What? Yeah. You've, you've given that to us today. So yeah, so I'm making a conscious decision from my point of view that you but can But in five years' time, I type David and it comes up with you and yeah. I email you so, accidentally. So what, what you should be doing with what used to be or still is to a certain extent office 365 but it's mic which will be microsoft 365 which is a combination of office 365 windows 10 and, and what they call ems enterprise mobility suite will give you the capability it, your it it admin may already set this up to automatically archive these 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 email addresses it should do uh, and this was before GDPR. This was just because it costs a lot of money to store this data on the cloud. So mm -hmm. you know, my boss, for example, has got an, e uh, an email folder, gigs and gigs and gigs. It doesn't matter now because it's, it's kind of pence. But you, you should have the correct IT policies and, and systems around to, for want of a better term, stop you keeping redundant information forever and mm -hmm. a day. Should have. Uh, again, you know, I'm, uh, you know we're, we're a Microsoft partner. I don't have shares in Microsoft, but they're doing a really good job uh, at getting their act together. And, and, and a lot of things we're talking about today, you know, we're not talking about hundreds or tens or, you know, lots of money. We're just talking about sensible best practice. I'm sure most of you spend more, you know, I don't know, on building security or alarms or something, but, you know, it's just a change of mindset, really. 
Uh, I'd like to ask, um, how does this affect uh, the use of cookies on websites? Um, you, you still need a, so you, you need two things, you, you should really have two things on your website. They kind of get merged sometimes now and again. One is a clear privacy policy, which talks about what you're doing with the data you collect on your website. I always say quote ours, I can't remember word for word what it says, um, but you should be clear about the information you're collecting uh, uh, and, and at least if you've got a data protection officer, they should be named uh, and all that information. Um, your, your cookie policy is kind of slightly um, separate. I, I would advise probably still having one, but it is covered in terms of the fact that if I can find out who you are through your IP address, that's personal data, you're a data subject. I, I work with Emily. I just wanted to follow up on the question about the companies who are members. Sure. It, it, we, uh, for us, they renew on an annual basis. In fact, we're in that process now. Um, would we need to go through that every year? So, for example, if a company renews, would we need to check again? Is this the list of contacts that we have of individuals within the company? Yeah. Is, is this still up to date? Is anyone need to be removed or yeah. added? I, I, so, so my straightforward advice to that is, you know, you might not need to, or you might not even think it's required because it doesn't change that much. I would advise it's very good practice to do that. Why not? Because you're then actively managing that, that, that data set. And I'd also, I'd also tell your members you're doing that. You know, this is the part of the kind of compete, or, or if you're not in a direct compete kind of, this is why you should be talking to us. Hi, me again. Um, as the only employee of my organization, I know exactly your who fault. holds all the data. I know exactly who controls all the data. So the question really comes down to also, I've got many other things to do. Is there somewhere, and I've not found it yet, and I'm sure you'll tell me there's an easy way to find it, a model policy that we can refer to to make sure our data protection policy is right for GDPR in May? Because we've got a DPP for the DPA, obviously, from March 2000 when it came in. Your data protection policy. Does it, how much does it need to be upgraded for GDPR from what it was? It, it, any, so here's my sort of blanket answer to the, the, the template question, privacy template, data protection. I, I kind of stopped short of best membership association template sign up. Go to the ICO website. Well, I looked there and it's, it's really not for the, the very small organisation. It tends to be a little bit sort of bigger than we were looking Have at. Have you, so, so on, I don't know when you last looked, but... but, but oh, oh. Before Christmas. Yeah, so, so um, the ICO, I mean, the ICO are an organisation, I'm sure most people hadn't heard of two years ago. They certainly will have, will have heard of in two years' time. Um, you know, there are about 30, 40 people based in um, Wilmslow, Cheshire. Um, I think they're now 250. You know, they've gone like that, and so is their communications. And... Uh, and they've realised and recognised, because you know, there's lots of small businesses in the UK, that the big global firms are kind of going to have their act together because they're going to even have a department or they're going to have their own law firm or their own compliance IT security. But it's the small guys. Small guys. We're small guys in that respect. So um, they've set up helplines. They've set up advice lines. They've set up toolkits. Um, you know, I, I, as I say, the only crit slight criticism I, I, I have is that you know, if you, if you went through the ICO, how ready am I for GDPR? I don't think it's called exactly that, but you'll find it on their website. If you went through that exercise today, bef as opposed to coming out of this room, you'll probably get a lot further than probably when you came into it, but you'll still go down a journey that says, well, I, I don't know the answer to that. If you don't know the answer to that, then that'll probably score against you. So when you get a little test at the bottom, a little say, you're not ready for GDPR yet. Or, or you're further down the road than you think. Oh. Hey, I, the, you know, I'm a big fan of, um, of, of the ICO website. And you've know, got a free helpline. Don't see what you want, phone them up. Uh, and they offer audits, they come out to site. I'm, I'm not sure they're free. So, so the old principle of share and steal, we've got to be careful. Share everything, steal the best idea. <laughs> la, 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 la. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah. 
I've got time. Can I ask you a question not, not association based? A bit like your mum's WI. Yeah. I have 250 children's details on my database Ooh. for a local youth football club. Yeah. Okay. I, I keep that on my PC and it's shared with each individual manager for the team. But each manager for the team only gets their Let team me ask you details. A question. Let me ask you a question to which I know the answer. Oh, I feel a little bit sweaty. Cause, cause, <laughs> oh, God. Hope you've got a good password. Oh, God. Um, let, let me ask you a question to which I know the answer. So I get involved in under 10s football and rugby coaching. And as part of being a coach, guess what I have to go through? DPS. DBS check. Yep. Yeah. Yeah basic stuff. Um, your club organisation uh, needs to be very clear, and my wife works in a school which is a similar kind of predicament, parent email stuff, needs to be very clear around gaining consent from the adults as to what data you're collecting about that child, where you're putting it, yeah. why you're collecting it, what you're doing with it, what happens when they're no longer in the club. Paper application form, that okay? Better Obviously, which I will now go home and be, be, digitally be, be, scan. Better than nothing. And I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not, um, you know, kind of ladder. I don't, I don't think the whole world has to be digital. I mean, it, 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 it's more efficient in some respects, and ultimately everything kind of ends up in a spreadsheet or, or email or something. But, um, you know, the, the, I think the, the third word in your sentence, children, you know, bang, special category of data than GDPR straight out of the box so um you know and then ask yourself the same question really you know how do you feel about your children's email contact details ending up in the wrong place probably slightly worse than your own we, sorry. i can probably answer that question sorry. Yeah. in another role i'm the secretary of the hampshire hockey umpires association just because I like to do lots of things, apart from being a chairman of governors at a school. Um, the answer to that question is you don't put the children's email addresses or anything in there. You only contact the parents, and that gets you around this problem. Yeah, do I'm not sure contacts. why I'd want to email a 10-year-old anyway. No, you do everything to the parents. email me a lot. But yeah. Seriously, you do it at that level, and you completely clear your problem. Do not hold that thing. Well, you, 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 you still hold the parent data, so you've moved out of special category. But, yeah. I, I don't think, unfortunately, that does resolve most issues, many issues, because um, what I see, um, sorry, from the association and association executives, and we have increasing numbers of professional societies reaching out to students who are 15 and above. So they're, they're, what they're wanting to do is get them excited by a career, be it science or engineering or chemistry. And, and this is happening actually more and more, not just those, those, those age-old uh, areas. And so they really are keeping this data and, and need to be careful. But okay. um, I don't know. So from, it, it, from, I think from a GDPR perspective, it's really st straightforward. You're dealing with, depending upon the actual child's age and they're defined as a child, <coughs> and I can't remember whether, I think it's 16 in the UK, you're dealing with a special category of data in terms of a minor. It's really simple. And, and as you might imagine, GDPR, there's different categories of data and there's different levels of fines. Do something really bad to a really special category of data, you're going to make the headlines. Uh, follow on. Can I, can, I do, can I just do one, one quick... Are we going to stay on this subject and I'll come back? I'll come back with the other question later from a, a remote delegate. Oh, sorry. Another question. Oh, I missed. Sorry. Apologies. I was just moving on to retention um, yep. and going back to the scenario of lapsed members. So we've yep. got a member. He lapsed five years ago. He didn't pay his fees. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Um, yep. There's the 
that data is therefore no longer relevant to us to a degree, but it's still relevant because he was a member. He, we have financial information to say he was a member. If we deleted his record, surely there's then a, a gap in the audit trail and the financial side of things, or not? I don't know, that, hence that's uh, why there's the question. I, I, I think the ITO view on that would be, as with any data subject you engage with at the outset you need to be very clear how long you're holding their data for and what happens to it when they go and and to and we have this conversation a lot with hr departments to to kind of point to a almost a just in case and there's 28 reasons it, you know you're better off saying at this given fixed point in time whether it's three months, I'd say three years is probably too long. You know, that's absolutely erased, it's deleted. We will inform you of that fact. There you go, end of. So if we were doing some historical reporting, so we've deleted him, he's gone, bye-bye, like I say. Um, but we were doing some historical reporting. Okay, so how many members did we have in 2013? Because he's gone, okay, so it's going to give us inaccurate data. So I, what I would seek to do there is... Um, anonymize that data and make sure it's it's anonymized anonymized properly and encrypted and there's n you know say, what's the definition of properly <laughs> um, well believe it or not within IT there's different levels of if my IT director was here it'd, it'd reel them off for you mm. but there's different levels of IT encryption I forget the exact one that's um, it's the common one that's compliant with GDPR okay <clears throat> okay no, that's cool, thank you. You're not the first person who asks. Yeah, no, okay. So reasonable. getting rid of the name and the address isn't good enough. It's got to be... If I can it? find out, and <coughs> not that I do it as a hobby, but you know, I know many people that can find out information, it, 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 and that's the whole point of GDPR. Okay. You know, if it was just the name, that would be easy. We can get your IP address, yeah. we can find out who you are. Okay, thank you. Um, I kind of have a unique situation because our company is basically four businesses, but we operate kind of under one umbrella. And we understand that through GDPR, we each have to have a separate policy per company and we can't share data per company. However, there's some employees that cross over in the same company, in over two companies. So I mean, my question is basically, how do they now operate? Because they're over two companies, but in the same umbrella. Okay, well, to start with, whether in one company or two yeah. companies... Um, they're an employee yeah. within your company. Um, you're processing the lawful basis. Yeah. Remember these things, <laughs> the lawful basis under which you're processing their personal data is through a contract with yeah. them, an employment contract yeah. with you. The fact that that's then one or more companies, I'd suggest you do as, as our company does. Okay. We're a company with a group yeah. of companies. So we've got a data protection officer that sits at the top. We've got HR that sits at the top uh, and the group company um, basically governs our employment contracts. Okay. Right. Thanks. Um, hello again. Um, so part of our, um, as part of our membership program, we offer a directory of the industry which has contact information for... A what, sorry? A directory. Directory. Okay. So we have uh, co contact information for lots of our partners um, yeah. and companies we work with, would that um, kind of go under the umbrella of when they're applying, they're giving their consent um, to share their you, contact details? Yeah, you need to tell them what you're going to do with your okay. data. And so if you're going to put that data on that website for these people to view, we're going to mail it to these people, we're going to send it to them, tell them what you're going to do with the data. Right. Okay, thank you. Give them the opportunity to say no, you know. Yeah. My question is... is yeah, just it's very similar to that one, but so we have their data, and going forward from May 25th, I'll you know include a message saying that we will be sharing this. Um, is that all that's necessarily needed? But uh, so, so new people that we add, I will uh, include a message saying that we're going to share it. But for all those who are already on our database. My main question is, how do I get their consent? How do I know that I have their consent? I can add all these new policies and new privacy statements going forward, but for those people who are already on our database, members and non-members, 
Um, so if you acquired those people on your database correctly in the first place, there's no reason why you can't communicate with them. Right. If you don't know who they are and how you got them, that's a problem. But if you do, yeah. there's no reason why you can't communicate with them and say, for example, we are updating our membership process. We are updating our membership terms and conditions. This is what we, and it might not just all be about GDPR. It might be other changes you're making in your organization. Um, to be clear, this is what we're doing with your data going forwards. If so, you prefer not to um, be part of this association, don't want to be, click here, contact this address. Transparent. I would prefer not to email all of them, of them and to, to give them a chance to, you know, want to leave. Mm. And <laughs> so it, what I want to know is, you know, I can add all this information and, and make it, you know, have a, I could have a pop-up window come up when they a access our website. And that would be a simple change for me mm. to get their consent if they want yeah, to use the I, website. I, I, I understand. Um, you know, if, if you didn't want to um, go to every single individual and kind of poke, 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 you know, don't try and fix that what isn't broken and invent yourself a whole new world of problems, then it, it may well be that you want to um, publish not only a very clear privacy policy, but a very clear data protection policy on, on your website uh, to illustrate your understanding of new regulations, what you're doing about that and how you're doing it. And perhaps, I don't know if you've got, uh, you know, if someone joins up as a member, they're a member for life, or presumably it lapses at some point, uh, you know, there then can be an updated membership form going forwards that is perhaps more comprehensive under a new environment than the previous one was. Perfectly sensible thing yeah. to do. Yeah, so for all the, the new forms, you know, I'll make it clear that I'm going to keep their data for a certain amount of time. Currently, we keep it forever. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you don't suggest, you suggest having a, a yeah, time you, you, limit. You, yeah, I mean, you, yeah. You'd just you'd, you'd fail out the blocks. I mean, from a, for if if they were, I mean, and again, just to kind of take the point that the ICO are going to have lots of people going around like kind of old TV detectors. You know, there is an element of they're interested in large businesses that are doing things very badly. You can go on the website. I think there was a, a um, telephone company today. You know, that does automated calls at, on the basis of people who'd also signed TPS. I don't know how much they got fined, a few thousands, but you know, these are the really bad guys. You know, the most important thing is to try and do, to, to, to educate yourself as best as possible and then try to do the correct, correct thing. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to double check when you say um, if existing members, if their information has been acquired correctly, what do you mean? Like I from uh, come from, you know, have a membership uh, company. Um, they either signed up previously on paper and now online, but we don't have, the, when they originally joined, joined up, there was no privacy statement then saying, we're going to keep your data for this long, we're going to do this with it. No, so no, what do we... Yeah. How do we then clarify but, that without? But but I think I members. think it's since two thousand nine there has been a privacy electronics communication regulation. This is not new. This has existed and it covers things like opt in, opt out boxes. So we talk a lot about soft opt out or hard opt. So when e privacy is written, it will be hard opt in, not soft opt out, which is what you should have been doing since two thousand and nine. I think it's two thousand and nine. Um, so, so, you know, PECA itself is fairly weighty regulation, but it's, it's not complicated. I, I mean, for many organisations, it's so much a wake-up call, but a kind of awareness of, OK, yeah, well, this stuff that I've already been doing, and, you know, maybe I just need to recheck that we've done some of it right. Um, but that's all to do with privacy electronic communication regulations, not the Data Protection Act, not GDPR. And, that, and that's all public domain as well. And it's not difficult to understand. It's not the most exciting thing to read in the world, but it's not difficult. for members renewing every year. Yeah, every year when they get the renewal subscriptions every year. Mm. And they agree to renew by direct debit or credit card. Mm. Um, you know, we've, we've got members who've been members for about, you know, 20, 25 years. Mm. Um, and every year we send them a renewal notice saying your membership 
subscriptions due um, and they renew by direct debit or credit card. Mm. Is that a form of consent? Consent to do what? Um, uh, uh, carrying on being a uh, member? Uh, uh, I think I would say probably not to just hand over my credit card details to let you do anything you want with my data without telling me. I'd be looking at a more robust process going forwards that even if it's through an updated version that says the whole world's changing, this is what we're doing, and you right. might want to publish that initially yeah. through your website <coughs> as opposed to contact every individual and for them yeah. to go. So we know. were going to run an exercise um, before all of this kicked in to approach all of our members because we want to update their regions. Um, and it's to say, this is the information we hold on you. Um, please, could you review it, update it as necessary, and let us know which region you belong to. That was an exercise we were going to do anyway. Mm. So as, I mean, now the GDPR has kicked in, so we can probably combine it and put in a you know, statement yeah. in there. I, I, it, it's such a common thing, and it, it is slightly nuanced, but, it, but it's really to do with how you acquired that data in the first place. And, it, yeah. and, it, and if, I guess you could evidence that that was before PECA, yeah. You know, and, and someone walked past in the street and said, yeah, sounds like a good idea, 20 quid, I'm in. You know, the crude end of this, you know, if you can, you, you can evidence that, that's fine. But the answer to, to this question, you know, whichever way it comes really is, you need to have acquired the data, let's assume that it's post-2009, you need to have acquired the data correctly in the first place. Nothing to do with GDPR at that point in time. GDPR is just kind of now you've got this data how did you get it and what you're doing with so it so if if we want if, if if it turns out that we weren't compliant pre or post 20, you know 2009 does that mean we have to delete all the information you shouldn't have it held? you we shouldn't should. have it yeah but, but if you've got legitimate interest which you almost certainly will have then that would be okay uh yeah if you have legitimate interest because they're all people you know they're in your sector Quite, then, then I think your best bet would be to update your processes, get them compliant. Depends what your lawful basis of processing is. Um, I, I think again, slight, there's a slight muddle there between they're an existing member. So, for, from if you take my business for example, we've got existing clients and customers. They have a contract with us. We're doing, you know, we've got their um, consent through that contract to process their data. Um, if I want to acquire new customers, then I'm doing that on a marketing basis using legitimate interest. So you might want to market to some of your existing database using legitimate interest, but I'd say that's getting... So just our members agreeing to pay for a membership or a journal is not necessarily... Uh, I, I would say that you need to explain a whole lot more what you're doing and why right. you're doing it and how you're managing controlling their data. Yeah, I think I think here every every time somebody joins, every time time somebody renews, you probably need to save either the 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 version of the terms and conditions, the version number, the reference of the terms that they've agreed to or the actual terms itself. So every time they renew, you ought to get them. What you might have noticed, or might not yet, that we do a six monthly renewal. Now our membership is free, but we're doing that because we know things change very quickly. So I don't know, you won't want to be doing that, but I think just add in those extra things. And I think, yes, you, if you are in a situation where your data is very badly not compliant, I think you do need to ask people not sorry, not ask them, you need to tell them that these are the terms and conditions of membership now, they've been updated to comply, explain why, and then they must agree to them. That's it. Not, not given an option to opt out. Yes. Those are the terms. That is your organisation. You've checked it, you've done it professionally, and asked them to do it. We commonly, everyone's used to getting those sort of demands from all sorts of technology providers. You've got no, cho you've got no choice, you've got to do it. So Otherwise you don't get it. You, 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 Is your email still the same? That's not enough, is it? You've but actually got them to... Got if, you've, to if you have it, changed yeah. your terms yeah. or if you're doing things new, mm -hmm. then yes, you've got to... You, absolutely, you've got to do that. Mm -hmm. we, I think most of us commonly get some sort of terms of terms have changed from online providers saying the terms have changed, this is it, 
please now you need to accept these. You, you've got no choice. And, and you, you need to explain a little bit behind you, behind it, behind the reason. But I think that's got to be part of your ingrained approach is that you have to manage these you know, acceptances very well. And if I'm not much mistaken, many people save the full terms and conditions with the record of your, of your renewal or your joining. The full terms and conditions, the text, the plain text. I mean, as individuals, you're going to all see a lot more of this through mobile phone companies or what, all of these organisations that have your personal data. You're going to see lots of different versions of this coming through. Okay. Are there any... I think we're pretty well... I think we ought to bring it to a close, if we can. Can you talk to David direct one-to-one? -one? Yeah, no, I've got a few seconds. Just the one question there. Any others, do talk to me or colleague here. Okay, and we've got a glass of wine for you here. Please, don't, don't rush and brush off. And Rhiannon's waiting patiently at the back. Anyone who wants to like, just have a quick waste round to view the, the facilities and the refurbishment and all the things they've been doing here. Um, Please, we will send you the evaluation tomorrow. It's a quick email. It's very short, only one page within you, actually not even a page. Please do fill that out so that we can get some idea, you know, obviously um, what more you want to know and some other bits and pieces uh, too. Please make sure you've joined at the website in order to get the follow-up documents and bits and pieces. There are handouts in addition to these little booklets, and we'll send you the link of where you can get the booklets as well, okay? So thank you very much, Guy. David. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. So if you, I need, I need to apologise because I do need to get out of here by 5.30 to get a train. That's my email. I, I will answer you back. Might not be immediately, but um, yeah. Okay. Could you have a quick chat with Lydia there? Yeah, yeah. sure. Super. Thank you very much. Thank you.